Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. This is the first time I speak at this particular conference, so you know, I apologize from the beginning if I make any mistakes. They're probably related to a very you know, high level of anxiety and ridiculous heart attack. So you know, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. If I speak too, too fast, just let me know, and I'll try to calm down. So um, second disclaimer, I come from a networking environment. I've been working with routers and switches and mostly BGP for longer than I'm willing to admit given how old I am. Uh, I enjoy it and I've recently been, let's say a few years, I've been introduced to BSD. I had a longer relationship with Linux. So I will be talking today about basically an implementation of Ansible for network devices from a BSD perspective. Um, we will do it a bit interactive, meaning that the talk is trimmed down. I will speak more than the slides. I'm not a big fan of reading of them. And if we still have time at the end, I actually want to show you what you can do in a customer environment. I have uh, the consent of one of my customers to show you a bit of a test. Uh, I will tell you a bit of the environment and what the script does, and you'll actually be able to see in real time how did it happen in a customer environment. And you'll see that my phone doesn't ring and my customer doesn't say, hey, please bring the data center back. <laughs> so let's get started. So as I said, um, I'm a network consultant and a co-founder of a small networking consultancy company. That's where my expertise comes from, as little as it might be. Um, my points of interest are those. Let's go a bit into, so I'm going to start with the networking part just to give a bit of context of why we're talking about this today. The BSD part will become more clear or self-evident as we go along. Um, this, despite the fact that it comes from Cisco, is a very nice thing in the sense that, you know, everybody's talking about containers, they're talking about the app world, we're all using fancy phones, and then, you know, every time I used to go to work, and I still, it's actually still the same screens nowadays, I have to do sometimes a telnet to a device because, you know, it's 2018 and people haven't heard of SSH yet, and I still get one command prompt. Now, you know, by a show of hands, how wrong is that? Who agrees that that is horribly, horribly wrong even today? What makes it even worse is the fact that, you know, at the time when we were doing one switch at a time or one router at a time, there was probably about four of them in an infrastructure or, you know, six or something along those lines. Now, the smallest infrastructure has something along the lines of seven, eight, 20, 50, 60, and a decent sized data center has, you know, starts at about 50 devices. Now, what is the most common thing that happens then? Well, you know, you have 50 devices and you have people that have to configure them and, you know, device A has config A, B, C and device B has conf uh, config X, Y, Z and it's never the same and it looks like a mess and, you know, I can bring up a few show run configs from a bunch of devices and you're going to wonder what the hell. And I'm going to tell you, these two are part of a cluster. <laughs> Here is the epitome and the most beautiful thing about networking, how we used to do things 20 years ago, how we're doing them. Well, 2014 is one thing, put 18 at the end, and I swear there's literally no difference between the two. Again, by a show of hands, how familiar are you with this? <laughs> now, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about automation and we're talking about orchestration. Um, Obviously, there's a difference between the two of them. One of them is basically how many times do I have to put the same command? I have 20 switches. I want VLAN 20 on 20 switches. That's a repeatable task. Basically, I have to find a way to create VLAN 20 on all of these at the same time with one set of commands. Often, server people were a lot smarter than you know, us network people, and they've figured out the ways to do scripts a lot sooner. In the networking world, for whatever reason, that caught on very slowly. Like even you, you had uh, scripted shells on top of Cisco and you could have done quite a few things. But even today, with the availability of so many tools, there's still very few people that want to use them. I don't know. It's like there's a certain amount of fun in opening 20 shells. So automation is sending VLAN 20 to 20 switches and had doing it only once and making sure that basically that VLAN is created in the same way everywhere. Meaning that if you want to give it a name or a description, it's always the same, not, you know, servers VLAN on switch one and then on the next one is green servers and on the next one it's God knows what. Now orchestration comes into place when you want to have multiple things done at the same time as part of a package. 
because let's take a service provider environment, because that we, and you want to provision a new customer. Well, usually you have more than just two things. You have an entire MPLS circuit that you want to provision, you want to assign it the route target, you want to put maybe some certain traffic engineering things on top of it. All of this are part of a package. And often they're very specific to that customer, but you need to apply it here, 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 and here. But again, you, don't, you have more than one command that you need to send. So you want to make out a package out of it. You put the BGP config on top of it, you put the VRF config, you put this, you made that, you put it everywhere. That's the combination of orchestration and automation in one go. Now this is where this becomes interesting. You can do automation, you can do orchestration with a bunch of tools, it's everybody's choice on how they want to do it. Obviously, it's easiest to do it with the tools that give you the most, as I say, opportunity to do it better. Um, I started out, I think before I got acquainted with Ansible, I was writing everything in Python, including how to call the switches, how to do this. Well, my scripts got longer and longer and longer, and at one point when, you know, just like every other adult out there, I saw Ansible, I'm like, I can now take this, find the trash can, drop it there, because somebody actually did it better. Now, there are certain drawbacks to Ansible, and there's still certain things you will want to program yourself, but the nice part is that the people that support Ansible, especially from the Cisco side or from the Juniper side, have also written the libraries for it. So if you have an entire data center made out of Nexus switches, for example, you can actually use the NXOS libraries for it, you integrate them into the Ansible part, and you just make a call to those things and say, I want an NXOS VLAN. And you just give it the variable, and it creates everything. We're going to see a bit later how that happens. That's exactly the example that we're going to follow with. Now, again, by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Ansible? How many of you use it in a networking environment? OK, so this is probably used to you then, uh, since it's particularly clear what it does. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the architecture part. How you install it is less, less, ah, less relevant. Uh, it's more important to understand the architecture of how it combines with playbooks and uh, what exactly you want to do. So I'm going to, to just blatantly steal the information from Ansible themselves. Uh, you take the configuration and you know you put it together in a process. That's pretty much what it is. It's, you structure it nicely and you send it to devices. So I was talking earlier about the concept of orchestration that I want to put that service provider configuration together and I want to send it to a bunch of devices. Well, that's what a playbook does and I think everybody here is familiar with that. The nicer part, especially if you compare it to doing your own scripts in Python, is that assume you're, I don't know, the lead engineer for your customer or I don't know, you're, you're one of the main ones, and you need to also teach the people around you how to do it. You'll find it often that, you know, Python is easy to read, but not that easy to troubleshoot, especially if you've never done it. So there's a certain amount of a learning curve that you need to follow. But with Ansible, all you have to do is be able to read. And maybe, you know, read a bit of documentation on the side. It's self-evident, and, you know, we're going to spend another 10 minutes going through the basic concept of Ansible, which is pretty much what you'd use to teach your junior engineer here. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to understand. And if you tomorrow want, I don't know, you want to automate something else, those are also the steps. Obviously, you can build quite a bit around it. There's discussions on serialization versus parallelism, which we're going to come back to it a bit later. In terms of what's more useful, and I realize that's not really a term, depending on what your infrastructure is supposed to do. Again, there's an asterisk there if you like YAML, you can use something else, but let's not get that far. The only thing probably that's important about YAML is what it ends and what it starts with, and the fact that best case, in, in the most cases you should just use a linter for it to make sure that your syntax is okay so that you don't run into ridiculous exceptions because it's not very verbose. So if something is wrong in it, it's not going to tell you exactly what, while the YAML linter is actually able to tell you, by the way, on line 32 something seems wrong, and at least you know where to look, and if you have a healthy comparison somewhere or a healthy config somewhere, you can see, ah, I probably put too many spaces here. By the way, no tabs, or preferably no tabs. Meaning that if you're me, the first time you did this, you're looking at some conflict because you're too lazy to read the actual documentation. So you're doing it and you see, that looks like a tab, tab. Line 10 has an issue. Why is it it looks exactly the same? That 
spend some time reading the documentation afterwards and being annoyed at it. Ah, it's two spaces. It's every time two spaces, even if it looks like it's one tab. I'm not sure if read the bleep manual is the right advice here, but you know, just don't forget that this one doesn't like tabs. The other nice part in Ansible and in orchestration in general is the fact that you can, imagine you're in charge of a big project. Imagine you're delivering, I don't know, an, an SP environment, a data center environment, and you're a, cons you're a consultant. So you're there only till the end of the project. And you want to give away this environment, but you don't want whomever support company is doing this to actually screw it up. So when you come back after a year that you have to fix it, that you're like, what did you do here? Which is often the question. You could always go for something like this, where as part of your project you build, um, let's say, a solution behind it to also manage it. And the templating part helps you that basically you say, okay, you have something to configure. Tell me the most basic things you have to configure in your infrastructure today. Interfaces, VLANs, routing, this or that. The templating part allows you to build the config for them, give it to them afterwards, and all they have to do is input, VLAN, uh, in, input certain variables. So if they have to configure it VLAN 10, again, there's only a prompt saying, which one do you want? Put it in there, and then it's always deployed in the same way. So to a certain degree, you also protect the infrastructure from bad configuration, forgetting devices, and genuinely always doing it the same. So as a simple example, I'm taking as usual BGP. I want to configure this. Obviously, you don't always instantiate uh, BGP itself, but you might want to add new peer policies, new whatever, you can always do it this way. This applies more for service provider environment where if I want to create, every time I want to create a new neighborship, I probably either want to create it as part of an existing peer policy, and in which case it's two lines, or if it's an entirely new customer, I might want to create an entirely new template for that customer and just fill in what I want. Is this clear so far? Are there questions? I sense a certain amount of confusion. Good. Or. So now, how do we get from left to right? Um, I want to have what's on the left side. Uh, ignore the fact that there's some extra config com configuration there. So this just some VLAN config. Uh, the VN segment is actually pertaining to VXON. I took this one because there's more than one line into it. Basically, it's what is the rule for creating this? You write it down, and that's your template. You identify what are the mobile parts or the variable parts, and the rest is just plain programming. But there's something more. What if we don't always want to input? What if we have 200 VLANs? Do we really want to go and say one, two, three every time and prompt it every time and make sure that it's sent every time? Well, apart from the fact that you can have templates, you can also have variable files. And this is what the next slide was about. Um, we can input from the beginning, I want on that switch, in this case, to create the following VLANs. You still have to write them because in the end, it's not an all-knowing mechanism. You still have to tell it what it needs to do. But when you do, you fill in such a document, you put it in, uh, in the correct location, and all of a sudden, this gets fed to the, with the template to the playbook, and then all of a sudden this gets submitted everywhere. So instead of doing it via multiple prompts or via the other disaster method logging in everywhere, you just do it by updating two files. And now I'm going to get a certain degree of hate because it says at Ubuntu there. There's a reason for that, so you know, keep your tomatoes for now. Um, remember, the, the point of the talk was BSD is not the most common uh, let's say, operating system that the, that the network engineer will use. Maybe because it's more obscure, maybe because, you know, they care less. In all fairness, I cared less in the beginning as well. I started out on, on BB and things, and honestly, I tried BSD just for funds. It's also the fact that usually in any infrastructure, you'll hear, you'll hear some cry out towards, we don't have support for this, and blah, and if you need a virtual machine with the OS on it, they will say, well, we can give you either Red Hat or CentOS, which is a discussion I'm currently having with my customers because I requested the machine, they say it has to be serviceable. So, yeah, 
we have to be able to pull patches on it. And even when I wanted to put the Ubuntu in there, it still wasn't an option because you know we don't have support for Ubuntu, but we do have support for this Red Hat distro. BSD is suffering a bit from the same, so naturally, if you're a network engineer that doesn't want to hassle too much, you're just going to get what they can give you and hope that Ansible or whatever you need works on it. But here's why you should push for more. So first, I'm going to do a slight marketing uh, sideshow right now, which is please come to the BOF on Saturday, well, tomorrow at lunch, the consultancy one, because your lack of support on BSD might be answered. I won't be the one speaking, so you know that might be useful. Uh, but do come if people cry about those things to you. If your customers say, we can't use BSD because you don't have support, come tomorrow. You might be surprised. Coming back to this, um, the other reason why I kept the slides with Ubuntu is that there was a question, how hard is it to do this on FreeBSD? And, you know, you're going to get the answer in about 15 minutes or so. First of all, this is very, very basic. You will never use this. You will never need a playbook that does show claw. It's just the point of the structure is pretty much the same whether you want to do a lot of things or a few things. But what do I have? I have a name. I have a bunch of hosts to which I want to apply it to. Um, and what type of a connection? And again, there is all debatable. There's lots of documentation on what you can do with those variables. Then I actually have the variable section, which I'm saying where do I want to do it or how to get there. What are the um, username and passwords I need to pass to those, uh, to those devices? And finally, how do I want to do it? All of this can be done differently, obviously. You can do uh, username and passwords in a, in a way that's more, let's say, um, security friendly. There, are, there is a concept of vaults, but you will always, with Ansible, have one problem, which is well, a bit annoying with, with networking. That is, you'll have only one login. So you, what you'll probably want to do in a networking infrastructure is, you know, you have this global user, which Ansible has to use to get on, on all these devices, but you will want to at least keep track of who logs in on the server, so if you, you can pair the two timestamps together. So let's say at 12 p.m. user X logs in on these switches and crashes everything, you want to know at least who logged in at 12 so that you can fire him, which is usually what management is asking for. <laughs> That has been my pet peeve with Ansible, the fact that I can't actually do um, associated logins. So if I log in with my username, Sabina, I want to make sure that I also go on the switches as Sabina. No, I go on the machine as Sabina, and the machine goes as Ansible user to the switches. So keep that one in mind. <coughs> then we go to what I actually want this playbook to do. And in this case, I, you know, I give that the task a name. I tell it what to do and how to do it, and pretty much what to do with the output. Tell me what the time is in this case. There's not more to it than that. Imagine that more complicated things means that there's either more of these or more extended version of this. But it's, again, the same commands. You run it by running the command for it, which is Ansible Playbook blah your file, and it applies on your selected host names. Now, we'll see later, we can do it a bit fancier. You can use your actual host names. Again, this is the most basic version of it. So I wanted to see, in this case, what time is it and who's my NTP, apparently. I got that. I also have certain statuses here. This you can also use. Um, you can sell to your management in the end as whenever I implement a change, and this is very important in enterprises, I want to have the output that it went OK, even more so if I'm doing it via an additional system. This is perfect, because you hit it. You hit it on, let's say, 30 devices, and you get a report on this. You want more output? Just hit more verbose. And you're going to see exactly what was deployed everywhere. What I have, how, however, noticed some time ago is that sometimes it will say, yes, I have deployed everywhere, and it will actually not. And you don't get a very good check of it. So what you could do is uh, have two playbooks one to actually implement and the other one to test. Because it becomes a bit of a problem if you have protocols that depend on each other. Think of a, a network that depends on a BGP adjacency thing. And if you don't have your neighborship everywhere, then this cluster will never come up. This was actually how we found it, because we were, um, we were trying to bring up in VX on a new pair of switches. I'll give a bit of background a bit later on how that works. But basically, in the routed background, it had to be available. So 
the BGP wasn't put in there, the OSPF wasn't put in there, so it wouldn't be coming up. This one said, I have successfully deployed all that you told me on these devices. You go on switch A1, wherever it was that it wasn't deployed, no trace of it. So best way to do this is to have an additional playbook just to check things. Or do a sanity check once in a while, a diff config between all of them and see, do I have at least the same line or the same idea? <coughs> to recap the Ansible part, um, again, don't forget about the spaces, the dashes, and the dots. You need to connect to all these devices. Um, you can do it via API calls as well, not only over SSH, so seeing that point there. Um, more and more devices nowadays actually allow you to talk to the API straight rather than, you know, do the entire dance of calling SSH and logging in and so on. The more you get into fabric networks, things like ACI, the very defunct Q fabric, the Contrail solution and so on and so forth, those actually allow you to talk straight to the fabric. So you do an API call to the environment, to the web environment, and from there to push certain calls. That's also possible with Ansible. In this talk specifically, we're still talking about command line things. But you're going to see how it works with the API on NXOS switches. Then further, how do you apply the configuration that we saw? We have a template. It's the, it's the usual question. What do we want to do? How do we want to do it? What are, what are the variables for it? And last but not least, you probably want to do uh, variable files as well, rather than input everything from command line. Now, we're getting to the more interesting part. I said I started out with uh, Ubuntu, Debian, and so on and so forth, um, but I got the challenge of trying this one out. FreeBSD actually wins at how fast you can deploy Ansible on it, so I had quite a few headaches when putting it together on Ubuntu because it wants a, a few more things and it has a few more dependencies and, well, you have to be careful with how you install and, uh, Python and make sure that you have the environments and so on. FreeBSD is actually a lot easier. I managed to get it up in about three commands, if not four. And provided you don't have a firewall somewhere sitting in front of you, there are literally no issues. There are, however, certain interpretations of how Ansible sees Python and how FreeBSD sees Python, and we're going to get that in about six or seven slides. How can you run Ansible on FreeBSD? Well, pretty much how you run it on everything else. You can have a bare metal device, you can have a VM somewhere, you can, it, it genuinely doesn't matter. Uh, it needs to be outside of the network, so that's, you know, I want to manage these devices, I probably should be able to reach them. So, you know, do a basic ping from them. And, um, you know, in case you're me and you're doing this at midnight and you're not in the, in the pseudo group, you're going to have a bit of a headache. This is literally all you need. So this is, if you were to summarize the stock, this is the slide. How easy is it to get Ansible and Ansible working on FreeBSD? That's all. So if you, if you stage a new machine right now, there's probably that entire part with, you know, going through Next and configuring it but much more than this, it isn't. Just in case you're wondering, it's on FreeBSD 11. Uh, you'll want the SSH de uh, daemon up, and obviously Python 2 for me, and Python 3 for whoever is on the other side of the fence. Now, one thing I ran into, and I'm looking at Benedict here if he also has this issue, <laughs> Uh, FreeBSD has the Python interpretation of whatever you want it to be rather than all the other distros which actually create a path towards it and make it a bit more difficult if you want to have 273 that you always have to put it in specific environments and so on and so forth. Whether FreeBSD has the interpretation of it of Python is not Python, Python is the ver version that you want it to be. Meaning that you have 2.7 in a folder and you have 3 dot whatever in another folder and so on and so forth. The issue is that Ansible is built around the idea of I will always find Python in the Python folder, which isn't version dependent. So you can do a dirty trick, and you know, before uh, Christoph sends many tomatoes at me, I'm going to say symbolic links, <laughs> and then I'm going to go away. But actually, the better way is to do it per um, per playbook. So you put it at the top of your all variable, uh, at the bottom of your all variables. You say, I want to use environment with 2.7. We're going to see in a second how that works. 
Uh, the nice part is that if you by any chance are using a playbook that uses, I don't know, 2.7 of Python and you have another playbook that makes use of Python 3, you can actually have both running in the same system without too much of a hassle. And I'll show you how in a second. So if you see this when you're running your, free, uh, your, your Ansible playbook on FreeBSD, especially if it says not found, it will likely be that issue, that or you didn't install Python. And now, in your host file, when you're, when you're describing your variables here, you basically point it to whatever the Python version that you want to use is. Now, this is what I said earlier. If you want to use tree, or your playbook makes use of certain Python scripts that use tree, then you change this part. And that's the only thing you have to do. But keep in mind, if you don't, this, don't do this from the beginning, it will not work. It will keep throwing this error, and it will be annoying. And yes, I know there's a hashtag in front of it. OK, so we're going to go in the live version of this, which always breaks and doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, uh, well, at Cisco Live, whenever somebody has a live presentation of something, there's a certain poll going around, like, will this work, or will it, you know, break halfway through and not be OK, and so on and so forth. But, you know, before I do that, I'm very, I'm very fond of this. <laughs> So I'm going to go. I'm going to go DevOps now on you know a bunch of devices. <laughs> so I have a few. I have a few ways to get in that infrastructure. This is not the only one. So in case I do break something, there's still you know some some level of survival. I'm going to mirror this now. In the meantime, before I do this, were there any questions uh, on the presentation itself? I, yeah. Is there some way to have uh, log out from that single line arrangement or searchable? Uh, you can actually store all the output in a file. And there are ways to actually put it more verbose. So for example, what would you like to see? You, yeah, I think I think you would. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but the thing is, you'd still do it in two commands, I think. But while you run it, or after you run it. Yeah. Well, it really depends on what you want to get out of it. If you want to get one grep in when you hit the one line Ansible playbook, then I think maybe what he's suggesting would work nicely. What else you could do is you can store it in a file and have another script that basically you, all, all you have to do is apply the, the search function on it and say what you want from it. And then you can store as much as you want, and you still have it for afterwards. Like, for example, if an incident happens, uh, you can go, what did I exactly deploy? And I can also see a bit uh, in context. So. I would recommend collecting that data and searching through it rather than doing it live. But I can see why that also has a certain amount of value. And indeed, I think Max was suggesting that for more of these things, Ansible Tower works better. Uh, but that's paid version. No, it doesn't. And it's paid, I think. But it's also, you know, supported. And it also has a uh, visual output of everything. So basically, if, if you want to, I'm marketing for Tower now for no reason. But uh, basically, the nice part about Tower is that if you give it to L1 support, they can use it straight out of the box. Like you don't have to explain to them what all of these are and how to use them and how to pass a variable to it and so on and so forth. So Tower is genuinely uh, a very friendly user interface, which provides you also more data on things. Like a 
Again, Yaml linters are definitely very, very useful. By the way, just in case you're wondering, the username and passwords here are time-based. So even if you're trying something funny, the, all of these disappear in about half an hour. <laughs> I'm, I'm paranoid enough, so. Um, but again, th this is a very all over the place of doing this. There are more organized ways, there's a better way, but the point was to show you how quickly you can get something done, not necessarily how, th what is the best absolute way. Um, you have to think of, with Ansible, you can do a bunch of things. Like, assume your customer, and especially with switches, this is a problem because they're at the core of your infrastructure rather than endpoints. You have quite, you have traffic for a lot of things going through them. Now, I expect that all of you understand the word under, uh, redundancy and having pairs and having everything connected to more than one switch. But when this happens, uh, you also have the challenge of upgrading. Imagine that the, I organize these in a very specific way. I've organized them per data center, I've organized them per type of switches, and so on and so forth. Assume you want tonight to do all the, um, all the upgrades of the switches, which are the first ones in the cluster. So you always have one and two, three and four, five and six. In order to still have redundancy, you want to upgrade one, three, five. So you always have one in the cluster that's still active, that if you have a server that's multi-home, they still have one connection up that's still alive. Well, what do you do with Ansible? You basically, you create a new set in there, which you say half upgrade or half DC upgrade, or I don't know, half a room update, and you put some of them in there, you put some of them in the second group, you do the upgrade of the first group tonight, and you do the upgrade of the second group tomorrow, and all you have to do is hit once and wait. Now, of course, you can also do it sequentially and wait for each of them to be done and so on if your infrastructure demands for that, but if you want to do it faster and elegant and you're fairly sure that your infrastructure can take it, this is one nice way of doing it well. Now, what else is there that's useful? Um, basically, you can organize them further in clusters. So you can see that initially I used host names because I'm more used to seeing the names rather than the IPs. I associated them to that, and then I put them in groups. Like, this is data center A. I pass these variables to data center A. You can actually use the same variables for all. This, again, was just a way of showing things. Again, another cluster, and let me see what else is there. And this is how basically you apply something or variable to everything in the cluster. You put it with all, you put the variables, and you send it further. Here is, again, for specific groups. So if you want to apply certain things to only a group and not another one, you do it like that. If you want to put it in the entire infrastructure, you generally use the keyword all. Clear so far? Oh, this is cut. So this is, again, a very simple thing. It's just taking a backup of all your devices. What does it do? It goes over all my devices, more precisely the group called all clusters rather than all, uh, and it applies, well, the variable file, which is the NXOS thing. And then how do I do it? And remember when I told you uh, that there's more than one way to talk to a device rather than just CLI? And I think this isn't showing it properly. Uh, Yeah, and then there's a backup. So when you're using non just plain CLI, you can apply a method to it rather than you know give a command. The command on a Cisco switch to back up the configuration is well essentially copy run start and pipe it to somewhere. This one actually uses the NXOS backup function that was written for Ansible. So that's why you say, see there NXOS config, the provider is the NX API, and then you have backup and you just say yes. And that's all you need to do. It actually takes less time to configure this one than it does to take copies of configs everywhere. Now, I have a folder in here somewhere called backup. And I already have some configs that are going to see these being overridden. By the way, Ansible Playbook does not autocomplete on FreeBSD. I don't know why.
So this is the, let's say, the shorter version of it. You can, you can always run it with mu multiple verbose, like if you wanted one, two, or three. Like, for example, for the, I don't know where my Python is. At one point, I ran it with three Vs just to see exactly what on earth it's complaining about. So again, basic Ansible things. These are my switches. We saw my library before. What did I do? I gather facts, meaning that I try to see if I, I meet the minimum requirements to be able to talk to these switches. Are they reachable? Can I apply this? Have I seen it before? And then I actually do what I'm asked to do in um, the task that is listed there. And then basically, what's the status? Now I'm not applying any configuration. So if you, if you do like conf d vlan 20, you'd have the uh, changed marked as one or two or however, how many tasks you actually need to execute and then there will be something for it. In this case, I'm doing a copy operation from it, which is, I have this, I want it here, I'm storing it locally. So did I actually store it locally? So it's probably something like 4 p.m. somewhere right now. It's 4 p.m. in Belgium right now. So uh, this machine is running in Belgium. So you see, I have all of these. I'm not going to go through the config because, you know, NDAs and stuff. Now, this is boring, this is simple. Let's look at something else. Uh, who here is familiar with VXON? So now I realize that maybe I should have gone into this a bit earlier, but um, who here is familiar with BGP and routed networks? And who here is familiar a little bit with MPLS? OK, so networks are a <laughs> <laughs> The best way to describe MPLS is imagine trucks on a highway. They're carrying lots of things and they have predetermined paths from getting from point A to point B. Uh, packets that are, for, exa for example, from Amazon, the thing that you ordered last week, the book that you want to get from Book Depository, all of these are available you know, in the same truck. That's basically your traffic being routed on the bigger network. But if it's... If, you think of UPS or two FedEx deposits or whatever as source and destination. Basically, between these two, you have a specific path, you're put in a specific tunnel, and you're being transported from here to there, regardless of where the packets have to uh, get later. That's the basic com concept of MPLS. Trucks moving things, trucks moving packets over a highway with a specific routing, and you have to know the routing from the beginning. VXLON is MPLS on more or less steroids, depending on which side of the argument you want to be on. Uh, strictly between, you know, engineers, the reason for which MPLS didn't end up going in the data center is that it's very, very expensive to implement. So the silicon that you need to be able to have MPLS working on those switches doesn't really outweigh the fact that those switches need to be cheap. So a data center switch has to provide lots of ports. So it needs to be more port dense rather than smart. So MPLS is very taxing on the silicon that's required. That would have made the switch more expensive, which would have made the margin of the company that's creating it a lot less, and you see where this is going. So they came up with a new protocol, which is uh, allegedly to address the largest, larger VLAN space, but that, by a long shot, wasn't the problem. <laughs> it was genuinely how to make it cheaper. Uh, so what VXON does is build this idea of a fabric network where everything is being routed with tunnels. So rather than having, uh, you know, I need to go from IP to IP, now I go, in a way, from an L2 perspective, I'm going from machine to machine, but I'm routing MAC addresses. I'm no longer routing IP. I'm routing MAC addresses on top of an IP network. So assume this is a data center, you have you know, machine A 10.20.20.20 and machine 2 in a very different subnet 10.1.30.30, for example. They both have a specific MAC address. Even if it's in the same VLAN, which in this case it wouldn't be, they still get routed. But even more so if they're outside that, that specific subnet, you have this MAC address. It belongs to a certain VLAN. It belongs to a certain VXON tunnel. And there's the routing in between, which still acts like normal routing, that makes sure that the two VXON tunnels can talk to each other. But strictly from a point of view of the, of the device, if you do a show IP route, you're going to see MAC addresses. And strictly for that purpose, And this is how it looks like. So you, so you have your routes, and you have a tunnel ID for them. And 
here, since this is an endpoint that talks directly to the host, it knows the IP for which it needs to route. And then, just for the fun of it, Here's what it actually writes. <coughs> I'm not going to go very far into the whole VXM concept, but you have to think of it this way. You have MAC addresses associated to the IP addresses, and instead of routing on IP, you basically take that, you put the label on top or an, and no, a tunnel on top of it, and the tunnel will have an ID that will be routed everywhere rather than you know taking the actual IP out of it. This allows a data center to still be L2, so you can still do things like vMotion. You can still do things like you know, uh, L2 redundancy without actually taking the L3, L3 boundary as, down as, uh, well, as low as the server, but still doing it on the resiliency of an L3 network, which basically allows you the fast conversions of things like OSPF, the routing capabilities of protocols like PGP. Questions? And on top of that, and I'm going to only do this for another two minutes. Here we go. This might become a bit more clear. So as I said before, we're using the uh, NXOS built-in API. We talk to that API and we give it the commands. So in order to create an L2, let's say address space or routable address space, you have to build a VLAN on steroids. So you have to build a VLAN and you give it a VXON identifier on top of it so that it can be routed in the long run. This is strictly for L2 uh, information to be passed on. So I have a bunch of variables that I would need to insert. I realize by everybody's faces that, that the, the best way to describe this now is what the hell is this? But you have to think of it this way. Uh, in, in fabric networks, and especially in things like VXLON, uh, the problem is that your configuration literally blows out of proportion because you now have about three protocols handling everything. You have OSPF because you need the adjacency for the BGP on top of it. You have VLONs that need to be associated with specific things into VXLON. And Compared to a normal L2 data center, where all you had to do is make sure that VLAN 20 is everywhere, here, all of those things also need to be replicated everywhere. So the VLAN part, the OSPF part, the BGP part, everything needs to be uh, replicated correctly and with the local variables for that specific switch. So, you know, while you had two commands before to make, to make something work, now you have about, I don't know, 15, 20. Multiply that by about 50 switches in a data center at least and you see why this becomes very useful. Not to mention that while you, know, you can put two descriptions on a VLAN differently, that won't be an issue, but if you start playing with uh, VXON identifiers and you make a mistake there, then basically I need to go from my identifier to basically my same identifier to be able to have an L2 connection. Well, this one is different. Well, okay, then I don't forward it here. <laughs> But here is my server where I actually need to go. This is my web server. This is my, I don't know, my database. Yeah, well, that's not going to work anymore now, will it? So if, if you ever have a customer that asks you, why should we bother, explain exactly this. How are you going to make sure that all the configuration always looks the same? How are you going to make sure that nobody makes a mistake? Well, you know, remove the human factor out of it, and it will work. So I will execute this now. Uh, which is, it will throw an error at me because it has already been executed. I don't actually want to create the same VLAN another time. <laughs> but, no, but here's the thing. Uh, the, the fun part is, and I actually didn't expect that when I started with Ansible, it actually checks. So I want to create the same VLAN twice? No. You're already there. And I want to show you that as well because showing it that you that it works is one thing, but showing you that it actually checks and goes, sees, and ah, okay, VLAN 20 is already there, then that's a bit different. You were mentioning that sometimes it doesn't execute certain tasks. And would you want to verify it after it's done rather than before it's done, just as a general principle? 
what I mean? When you were mentioning earlier that, uh, that sometimes some of the reactors will have time to interrupt. Yeah. Why? I don't know. So I'm, I'm genuinely assuming that that's an issue in uh, Ansible itself. That's The thing is, um, I actually don't get an exception when something doesn't get deployed. So you remember those three categories of codes you could have gotten there with uh, changed, unchanged, error? If there's a, you'll see now that when we try to deploy it for an existing VLAN, it actually says, no, no, this is already there, don't try. The problem is, and I need to hurry now, the problem is when it actually says it did it, but it didn't. And I don't know if it's a problem with Ansible, and I'm looking at Benedict if you ever encountered it, or it's a problem with the NXOS API. Because I haven't figured out whether it's, you know, Cisco that is not passing the information to the switch, or is Ansible not correctly getting the state of it. Oh, now it should, <laughs> now it should be yellow and red. Ta -da. So this is I've I already have this. I'm trying to create VDAN 532, which I created about two weeks ago. Um, it has all the details regarding of why it failed, and well, it doesn't actually tell me that it's because it's already there. But. It, the way I managed to interpret this is I found something in the place I need to create it. So I'm throwing pretty much any exception that I have available. And now I see that there are switches which, you know, didn't have it created for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just a VLAN. <laughs> well... You, you know, by the end of the day, if any of you have knowledge of a, of a cu potential customer that's looking for a network engineer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit the point. So, um, <laughs> since this is a data center, these VLANs usually need to exist everywhere because all of these are access leaves. The concept of access leaves means you have uh, server storage, whatever, and if they all need to talk in this VLAN, then the VLAN needs to be pre present there, and then you start subscribing to that VLAN. That's pretty much it. I'm not doing it on cores, for example. I'm not doing it on spine level switches. I'm not doing on, um, I don't know, there aren't many categories of switches anymore. So. This, for me, is a nicer way of working because the, the original environment of this customer used to be, well, you know, a scientific mess in the sense that you needed surgical equipment just to figure out what the hell. And uh, it went from switches, VLANs, spanning tree everywhere to a no spanning tree, no nothing kind of network, only routed and only towards the edges that I actually speak plain VLANs. And I thought there will be no other switches till, you know, literally yesterday somebody comes with the point and says, hey, you know, on this, on this HP device, there's actually a switch integrated and it speaks spanning tree and your environment is blocking it. Yes, stop talking spanning tree to me because we only do route it now. <laughs> <coughs> and this is actually an output I wanted to see. Um, that failed because obviously it's not there. This is not changed because nothing new has been applied in the end, so I was wrong about the status. All of the switches are reachable. Uh, I'm guessing one and two didn't reply because I don't know, I have no idea. And now just for the sake of it, I have S1 and S2 in there. I can actually go on the switch itself.
I think it was 532. And there it is. Now, of course, you can get a lot more creative with these things. This just creates a very basic conflict. Assume, think about it, um, and especially think about it from a support perspective. You have people um, trying to configure many interfaces because there's new environments coming in and so on and so forth. You have this, you just put variables at the end of the interface, and you deploy. I don't have time for questions, but questions? <laughs> if not, I think I'm out of time. Thank you for joining us.